Okay, welcome everybody. The topic for the next two weeks. So, we all have an idea of what the presence of God is. In our own minds, we have a picture of what that looks like. But quite simply, being in the presence of somebody or something is this. I'm currently in the presence of Pastor Knutzer, and he is in the presence of me, is he not? That's the simplest meaning of it. We are in each other's company, in each other's presence. You've heard people say before, wow, I met such and such a soccer player or such and such a politician or so-and-so who's a famous musician, and people say I was in the presence of greatness. You've heard this because they met the person. But presence is this. We are in each other's presence. So there's no real fancy way of putting it. Being in God's presence is communion, is it not? It's fellowship. So, before we continue, what do you hope to get by entering the presence of God? Are you after an experience where the goosebumps are going and you're feeling faint and the light is shining bright? Or are you after communion? Are you after relationship? Well, you know, let's look at this. The Old Testament Hebrew, and I might be butchering the pronunciation, but they use the word porne. And porne we translate in our English Bibles as presence, specifically relating to being in the presence of God. Now, that literally means, the word porne, it literally means the part that turns. It means the part that turns. It means face. Because the face turns, right? That's the idea. So when the Bible speaks of the presence of God, it literally refers to the face of God. So Psalm chapter 80, you have to turn there actually translates this word as face. It says in verse 3, Restore us, O God, let your face, your porne, shine, that we may be saved. Let your presence shine. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, After Adam and Eve had sinned, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the porne, of God. They hid themselves from God's face. Genesis chapter 4, verse 14. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. This is now speaking of Cain. Cain has just murdered his brother. He's speaking to God. From your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer of the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. We'll skip to verse 16. Then Cain went away from the porne, the presence of God. So Cain went and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So it is the face of God. The face of God upon a person constitutes being in his presence in this context. Before we look further, let's look at Genesis chapter 6. Verse 1, it says, When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, his day shall be 120 years. Important. We've defined presence as face on the part that turns. It's also important to speak of God's spirit. Here we learn that spirit is the Hebrew word ruach, which literally means breath or wind. So what do we have? We have the face of God, the presence, and from that mouth, the breath, isn't it? The ruach. So somewhere, somehow, so far it would seem that the presence of God, the face of God, is connected 
to the Spirit of God. Adam and Eve walked and talked with God in His presence, did they not? What happened after they were expelled? The presence of God wasn't walking and talking with Adam and Eve as He was in the garden. But He had a conversation with Cain. Did He not? Cain said, you are going to hide your face from me. And because of that, I will be killed. And God said, I will put a mark on you. They had a conversation. Cain was in God's presence. As things progress, the world gets worse and worse. The sons of God come down to the daughters of men. Abominations are born from it, the Nephilim. Mankind is wicked. God says, my spirit will not strive with mankind forever. Already, he's slowly withdrawn his presence. Now he's making the statement that his spirit will not put up with this nonsense forever. There's a connection between the face and the breath, between the presence and the spirit. So we fast forward to after the flood after the Tower of Babel, after the captivity in Egypt, and we find ourselves in the wilderness with Uncle Moses. Not that Uncle Moses. And we find out that Moses had a special relationship with God. He was, at that time, as best as I could tell, the only living human being who had access to God's presence. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 33, if you have your Bible with you. Exodus chapter 33. Now remember, Moses constructed the tent of meeting. The presence of God would come down, and Moses would enter the tent of meeting, and he would commune with God on behalf of the people of Israel. Let's just read from verse 10. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud... Standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus, the Lord used to speak to Moses, Pone to Pone, face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. Verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. And yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, What? My presence, my porne, will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people? from every other people on the face of the earth. And the Lord said to Moses, The very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. Now, we're not going to go into depth about glory this week, but make a note, because the glory of the Lord... Is tied in to the presence. Moses says, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But verse 20, but he said, you cannot see my poor nay face. For man shall not see me 
and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Did you pick up the contradiction? There's a contradiction between verse 11 and verses 20 and 23. Verse 11 says, Moses and God met Porne to Porne, face to face. Well, how is it that Moses was able to do this in verse 11, but in verse 20, he's told that he would die if he saw God's face? We've established it's the same word, it's the same Hebrew word, Porne, face, presence. Porne to Porne. But if you look upon my porne, you will die. How does that work? You see, this is a, one of those passages that uh, the atheists love to pull out and stump Christians with and make you doubt your faith and make you doubt the inerrancy of God's word. The answer is in the word porne. We've already established that I and Pastor Kunza are in each other's presence. I'm not necessarily looking at his face. Right? We've also established that porne means face, secondary to the part that turns about. And also, the context of this thing is God says, what? So Moses says, verse 18, please show me your glory. This is now after we were told that they met face to face. And God says, yes, I will make my goodness pass before you. I will be gracious upon who I will be gracious, show mercy upon who I will show mercy. But now God clarifies. Remember how the Bible's written. You get headlines, and then you get the article. The headline is, Moses and God met face to face. That's the headline. Ooh, that's attention grabbing. Let's go read the article. God makes it clear, you cannot look upon my face. You'll die. You will burn up. I am an all-consuming fire. But you will see, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes, the Shekinah associated with the cloud, right? While my glory passes, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until my glory has passed. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. There's a bit of a hint here about Christ, which is for next week, but I'll just point it out. You shall stand on the rock. Keep that in mind for next week. So, what Moses is having here is a far cry from what Adam and Eve had. Adam and Eve walked and talked in the garden with God. Moses could not look upon his face. What happened? Sin. Sin is separation from God. And what does Romans 6 verse 23 tell us? For the wages of sin is death. What does God tell Moses? If you look upon my face, you will die. What is the commonality? Sin. Was Moses sinless? No. There was only one man who was sinless, and that was Jesus. Moses was a great prophet, but he was still a man. And he still made mistakes, and he was still unrighteous before a righteous God. Every meeting with God after the fall of man was never in God's fullness. 
God was always veiled in some way for the protection of the people, whether by a cloud, whether by a sacrificial offering covering in the case of the Levitical high priest, or by taking on the flesh of humanity. And who took on the flesh of humanity? Jesus. Jesus Christ was most certainly God in the flesh. And guess what he did? He walked and he talked with thousands of people. And no one died. Even after he rose from the dead and was glorified, the disciples did not die in his presence. Why? Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. But we just heard the Father say, if you look upon my face, you will die. Now, Jesus is God in the flesh. What gives? What gives? Simple. God is spirit. What houses the spirit in a human sense? The flesh. It is a covering. Do you understand? Just like God covered Moses with his hand. Just like he veiled his presence in the cloud. Just like he was literally behind a veil in the Holy of Holies to protect the Levitical high priest. The flesh acts as a veil. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 17. We'll read from verse 1. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother and led them up a high mountain by themselves, that is Mount Hermon. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, while this was happening, <laughs> Lord, it is good that we are here. I'm sure you can hear the excitement in Peter's voice. <laughs> Such a, what a blessing that you invited me. If you wish, I will make three tents here. One for you and one for Moses and the other for Elijah. Why did Peter want to do that? Because he thought the Feast of Tabernacles was being fulfilled right then and there. The Feast of Tabernacles, the ultimate fulfillment is, I will be their God and they will be my people and I will dwell among them. God dwelling with man like he did in the Garden of Eden would be the ultimate fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's also called the Feast of Booths, Tents. That's why you wanted to know, hey, can I build you guys a tent? Because you're going to be sticking around. Because that would signal to him the beginning of the Messianic kingdom. God establishing his kingdom on earth. Verse 5. He was still speaking, old Peter, when behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. The glory of God in that instance was not veiled in a sense as Christ was veiled in flesh, although revealing his glory. They fell down. They covered their faces. They were in fear. Verse 7, But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. When the true power of God showed up, they could not bear to look upon it, even though it was veiled, in a sense, within a cloud. 
when we look at the rapture and the resurrection, one of the questions I asked you guys is, what is the purpose of the rapture and the resurrection? What is the purpose of us receiving glorified bodies? Well, this is the very reason we will receive glorified bodies. Because when we have glorified bod bodies, we will once again be able to be in the very presence of God, just like Adam and Eve. There will be no need for a covering. You understand? Think about it. The glory of God is tied into His presence, it's tied into His Spirit, and obviously it's tied into His Son. It's tied into Jesus. Everything works together. Here, Israel, your God is one. So if Christ is glorified, if God is glory, it makes sense that for us to truly, physically, emotionally, spiritually, 100% enter His presence, we too would need glorification. Something needs to change because we lost something at the fall. So there's a very quick run through of a few ideas of why we find ourselves where we find ourselves now. But what about now? The resurrection hasn't taken place. The rapture has not taken place. We are still in this world. The final chapter of this world we may be living in, but the end has not yet come. So that's fantastic. It's a future hope to commune like this with God, with Jesus. But what about now? How do you enter the presence of God in your fallen state now? And I told you we're not going to the New Testament tonight. So turn with me to the prophet Ezekiel. Because the prophet Ezekiel is going to give us a clue. And I've already given you a clue. So this is technically clue number two. We'll read chapter 1, verse 25. And we'll stop in chapter 2 verse 2 and probably a good time to remind everyone that in the original languages there was no chapter and verse divisions it was one continuous thought so ezekiel chapter 1 verse 25 and there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads when they stood still they let down their wings and above the expanse over their heads there was the likeness of a throne in appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw it as it were the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of brightness all around. There will be the rainbow. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking, chapter 2, verse 1. And he said to me, Son of man, Stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. Here we learn two things. In Ezekiel's vision, God has the appearance of the likeness of a man. This again points to Christ. 
who is still yet future to Ezekiel's time. And what's the second thing we learn? It is God's spirit that allowed him to stand before God. God's spirit entered him, put him on his feet, and he stood and God spoke to him. In closing tonight, the presence of God has been sought after by those who worship him since the fall of man. The presence of God in the Old Testament, although veiled, was always exclusive to those anointed with his spirit. The spirit of God in the Old Testament was exclusively reserved for prophets and for kings. But all this was before God came in the flesh. God's presence is likened to his face. Pastor, what's that, that scripture you love so much? His eyes dot to and fro over the earth. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards him. What's on the face? The eyes. Is it not? I want to set a picture. What proceeds from the mouth of God? The breath, the wind, the ruach, the spirit. What do we get in the New Testament? We get God in the flesh. He walks and he talks. Just like God in the Old Testament walked and he talked. The difference was Adam and Eve didn't need protection from God's presence. For when God made everything, he said it was good. Man falls. Since the expulsion from Eden, those who have known Yahweh or known of Yahweh have wanted to return. There was always this longing for man to have communion with God. It's one of the reasons we have the Feast of Tabernacles. It was there as a dress rehearsal for Israel that one day God will once again walk amongst his people. The kings in the Old Testament, by being anointed as king, you had the power of God's spirit. By being anointed as a prophet, you had the power of God's spirit. Those special individuals had access to God's presence. The Levitical high priest once a year had to make a special sacrifice. It was a sacrifice of covering. Without the sacrifice, if he entered, he would die. With Moses, we will meet but you will see my back. If you look upon my face, you will die. I am righteous. You are unrighteous. Whatever is unrighteous will be burnt up in the presence of God. It is the reason we will one day be glorified. But right now, things are not under the old covenant. For God has come down in the flesh. What? has changed since the Old Testament. Besides the sacrifice, besides Christ becoming the Passover lamb and no longer covering sin, but paying for it, what else has happened? We got His Holy Spirit. Well, there's a stark difference. No longer is it just Ezekiel and David with the Spirit of God, but believers have the Spirit of God. No longer do we need a Levitical high priest to make sacrifices once a year for our sins to be covered, 
we have Jesus as the perfect sacrifice and high priest now, sitting at the right hand of God. So, in Christ we are made righteous. We have been given His Spirit. So to me, we have everything we need to enter His presence. So why do some churches like to make it overly complicated? We will go deeper next week into this. We will look at what the New Testament actually teaches. You need to know who you are. Your identity in Christ is paramount. You need to know what has been done for you. You need to know that the veil has been torn. That veil was torn when Jesus gave up his spirit on the cross. So therefore, everything has been laid open. Jesus says, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father into His presence but by me, but through me. So we know these things. We know. So we've got His Spirit. Ezekiel was like, ooh, I'm going to die. This is it. <laughs> Couldn't get up. He was, was petrified. God's Spirit entered him and stood him up. You have God's Spirit. The Bible teaches the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in each and every believer. Your sins have been forgiven. Christ is your righteousness. You are not righteous on your own. He is your righteousness. So the problem of righteousness and unrighteousness is out the way. Is it not? So then what is preventing us from entering his presence is it a magical ritual that we are meant to perform is it a special set of prayers that we are meant to utter or is it there for all who seek it who are in Christ we will look next week at what the New Testament has to say and some more practical advice but for now, let me leave you with that question. If you are born again, if you have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you, what is stopping you from entering His presence? I'll add another one. If you are the temple of God, where does His presence dwell? We'll conclude next week.